Welcome to week one of our course, The Boltzmann Law of Physics to Computing. And this is the second lecture. Now, in the first lecture, we introduced this Boltzmann Law. You know, this is the central principle of equilibrium statistical mechanics that says that in equilibrium, the probabilities of the different states are given by this expression. Now, in this lecture, we'll try to justify it. Now, <clears throat> in the last lecture, I'd introduced this notion of state space, which is kind of fundamental to much of what we'll be discussing in this course. And the Boltzmann law applies to this state space. And there I took an example of a problem where you had two one electron levels and which gave rise to two squared or four states in state space. Now, more generally, you could, of course, have an arbitrary number of states in state space. And for this discussion now, we'll just say they are labeled as one, two, three, four, etc. And each state is characterized by a certain number of electrons and a certain total energy. And what we want to show is that why the probability that the system is in one of these states should be given by this Boltzmann law. Okay. Now, in order to discuss this point, the first thing to note is that what we are considering is that this system is continually exchanging energy as well as particles, meaning electrons in this case, with the surroundings, which we call the reservoir, something big with lots of energy and particles available, and which have, which are characterized by an electrochemical potential mu and a temperature T. And the notion of what these means actually, that is something we'll hopefully we'll get a little clearer as we go further in this lecture. Now, so the main point is that the system is not an isolated system. It's not like it cannot exchange any energy or particles, because if that were the case, then of course, E and N couldn't change, because if you start it off somewhere, it would kind of stay that way. But in order to be able to change states within the system, you need to be able to exchange with some reservoir. Now, in some cases though, you might have a system where you can only exchange energy, but cannot exchange particles, for example. Now, in that case, of course, because you cannot exchange particles, the N sub I would be fixed. In other words, the system would always be in states whose, which have all the same N sub I because after all, the particles have nowhere to go. So if you're in a two electron state, you stay in a two electron state. Now in that case, you see this Boltzmann law, you know, we have these two terms in the exponent. You can separate them out and write it in this way. You know, there's this minus sign here and another minus, so that gives this plus, and then the energy I've written separately. And you see if the n sub i is fixed, then you see, this is also kind of part of the constant. Remember, we have this constant in front to make sure all probabilities add up to one. But if the n sub i is also fixed, then we could take it as part of that constant. And then you'd have an x probability that could be written like this without invoking the n sub i explicitly. So sometimes, depending on the problem at hand, one might be using this expression rather than the other one. See, and, and this is the case that is generally referred to as a canonical ensemble. That means where you have an ensemble of systems where you, that exchange only energy with the reservoir, whereas if it is exchanging both energy and particles, then you call it a grand canonical ensemble. So those are the technical names that you'd see if you 
looked at a book in statistical physics. Okay. Now, for this discussion, for, let us first focus on the canonical ensemble, where it's only exchanging energy. So the expression we are trying to understand or justify is the one shown here, without the mu and the n appearing explicitly. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, it is connected to this reservoir with which it is exchanging energy. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the question you might ask is, the Boltzmann law says that the more the energy, lower the probability. Now, why is that? Because ordinarily you might have thought that if I have a thing sitting by itself, all states would be equally probable. Why is it that lower energy has higher probability? And the answer is that you see, you have to consider the states of the entire si system, meaning system plus reservoir. The whole thing will be fluctuating around among the different available states with equal probability for all different composite states. But the point is that if the system is, say, in the lower state, one, then corresponding to that, the reservoir has, let's say, a certain number of states, which I'll call, say, W1. W1 is the number of states in the reservoir that correspond to the system being one. Similarly, if the system is in state two, the reservoir has, say, W2 number of states. And the point is that the system in general would be would have equal probability, but when you look at one, it corresponds to many more states of the reservoir than when it is in state two. And why is that? Well, because you see, when the system has a lower energy, the reservoir has a higher energy because together they have the same energy E0 plus epsilon. And so when the system gets a little more energy, it means that the reservoir has a little less energy. And if the and so that's the first point. That lower system energy means higher reservoir energy. The second point is that if the reservoir has more energy, then it will also have more states that it can access. So those are the two key points. Remember, what we are trying to understand is why the system has a higher probability for being in a lower energy state. And the answer is, well, if the system is has lower energy, reservoir has higher energy, and if it has higher energy, it can access a lot more states. And so we define something called entropy. And this is again one of those very deep seminal concepts. And this S is a proportional is to the logarithm of the number of states available to this reservoir if it has an energy E. And the idea is more the energy E, the more the number of states available. So bigger W is and conse consequently bigger the entropy. Okay. Now, now we'll do a little bit of algebra, and that is we start from S equals K log W, and we can turn it around and write as W is equal to E to the power S divided by K. Now, if I want to know the probability that the system will be in state one, as opposed to in state two, that ratio, the point is the ratio will be proportional to the number of states of the reservoir that correspond to it. So P1 over P2 would be equal to W1 over W2. So the idea is, okay, let's say there's 100 states of the reservoir for W1 and only 10 for W2. Then P1 will be, P1 is to P2 would be like 100 is to 10 because P1, although it looks like one state when you look in the system, for the composite thing, it looks like 100 states. And P2, again, also looks like one state for the system, but the composite thing corresponds to 10 states. And of course, 100 states have more 
the overall thing is more likely to be in the 100 states than in the 10 states. That's the es essential point. Okay. So now we'll do a little algebra and go on from here and obtain the Boltzmann law. So basically we're saying P1 over P2 is W1 over W2. W1 corresponds to this function W with energy equal to E0 plus epsilon, whereas W2 corresponds to W with energy E0. And then for W, let us replace it in terms of entropy by writing it as exponential of this entropy functions. And when you have a ratio of exponentials like this, you can combine them and write it as the difference between the two. Now this difference is something I will now approximate by using the fact that the reservoir is a huge thing with a lot of energy. So this epsilon is kind of like a small change in its energy. And so we can write the derivative of the entropy of the reservoir with respect to energy in this form. As you know, when you first learn about derivatives in, in college, they define it this way with in the limit as epsilon tends to zero. And in this case, we'd argue that epsilon being the energy of this little system, it is kind of like zero in the context of the huge reservoir energy. So you could write the derivative in this form. What that means is I could write this difference as epsilon times the derivative. Right? So that's what I've done here. And then the key point is that this derivative is what is defined as the inverse temperature of the reservoir. That's what is called 1 over capital T. And so now you can put it all together. You have the epsilon over T, and then there's the K here, which brings us to epsilon over KT. So basically it says that the ratio of P1 to P2 is equal to e to the power, this difference in energies over KT. And note, of course, what I've written as epsilon is basically E2 minus E1. So what we are saying then is that P1 over P2 is like E to the power E2 minus E1 divided by KT, which you could write in this form. Right? I have E to the power minus E1, and I've written E to the power E2 in the denominator with an extra minus. Now, now you can see that the result we have obtained is basically consistent with the Boltzmann law. Namely, what Boltzmann law said is the probability of any state i is proportional to e to the power minus ei over kt. And what we showed in the last few slides is that if I consider any two states of our system, one and two, the ratio of their probabilities will be in the ratio of these exponentials, which is consistent with exactly what the Boltzmann law states. So just recapping what we did again, you're trying to figure out the probabilities for the system. So we said that consider the entire system plus reservoir and together they will have, the composite system will spend equal time in all possible states and so the ratio of P1 to P2 is proportional to the ratio of the corresponding states of the reservoir, which then is equal, can be written as e to the power epsilon over kt, where this inverse temperature is defined in terms of the energy derivative of the entropy function. So that's the what you have done. And in the next few slides, let me just show how this derivation is extended to the grand canonical ensemble, namely the case where you are also exchanging particles. Because remember, I kind of simplified things a little by saying, let's assume particles are not exchanged, only energy is. So when you exchange particles, as I mentioned before, the more general Boltzmann law would not have just EI, but would have EI minus mu n sub i. And what I had argued before was that if n sub i were fixed, then you could essentially write it this way. And that's the canonical ensemble. Well, if you want to include the variations in particles, then 
what would happen is P1 over P2 would still be equal to this W1 over W2. But now, W would be a function of both E and N. And again, when they exchange energy and particles, of course, the total energy stays constant, total number of particles stays constant. So the one that has a lower number of particles would co correspond to a higher number for the reservoir. So just as we had argued if P2 had an energy of E0, I mean, if the reservoir had energy E0 corresponding to P2, then it would have energy E0 plus epsilon corresponding to P1, where epsilon was the energy difference. Similarly, if the reservoir has N0 particles corresponding to 2, then it would have N0 plus N particles corresponding to P1, where the small n represents the energy difference, uh, represents the difference in the number of particles. And what you can show is that this or two can be written as e to the power epsilon minus mu n over kt, where this extra factor, this minus mu over t now, is defined in terms of the derivative of the entropy function with respect to n. You see, previously we wrote derivative of the entropy function with respect to energy as 1 over t. Now we are writing der derivative of the entropy function with respect to the number of particles as minus mu over t. And when you put that in there, you'll get this relation, which is consistent with the Boltzmann law as stated for the grand canonical ensemble. So that kind of completes the overall derivation here. What needs more discussion is that, well, why is the entropy, why can we define this temperature as del S del E irrespective of the details of the reservoir? You see, the reason the Boltzmann law is so general, you see, what I had said earlier, even when we introduced this, is that it's a general law that applies to everything. It doesn't matter how complicated your system is. It could be superconducting. It could be a very strong interacting system, or it could be something really simple, like just a single level. It doesn't matter how complicated or simple it is. The law is the same. Now, why is the law the same for all systems, irrespective of its details? And the answer is, well, it's because this is a property not of the system, but of the reservoir. And what it really ref reflects is the non-obvious fact that all normal reservoirs, irrespective of details, kind of have this property. That if you look at the number of states available, the W, and define the entropy function in this way, then this del S over del E would be like the temperature, and the del S del N would be, like, would be involved this mu, and this is irrespective of exactly what the reservoir constitutes, is comprised of. Because, as I said, in this discussion, we're just saying you know, the system is in equilibrium with any reservoir. And this would apply irrespective. And that is not really obvious. But what we'll do is, I think in the next lecture, we'll try to clarify this point a little. So we'll talk more about this concept of entropy. So to sum up again, in this lecture, we justified the Boltzmann law. You see, the first lecture, we had introduced the Boltzmann law. Second lecture, we justified the Boltzmann law. But in the process, we introduced this concept of entropy, which is related to this, the states of the reservoir. And in the next lecture, what we'll try to do is we'll evaluate and justify these properties of entropy. Thank you.